go around the block, come back in, and tell us you're 18. That was the advice that the recruiting sergeant gave my great uncle, uh, Uncle Dan, Dan Costley, uh, when he went to join the Middlesex Regiment. And uh, he was doing that because he wanted to meet up with his brothers, who were over in France at the time. And, uh, and so at the age of 16, he joined up. So he actually was killed in, uh, in October of 1916 in the Battle of the Somme. And he is actually one of uh, many people that actually uh, were killed and who have no known grave. So they had to construct a memorial that was big enough to put the 70,000 names of soldiers who died and were never identified. Uh, this is just for the five months of the Battle of the Somme, which is from uh, July 1st until uh, November. And uh, so when you go around that amazing uh, structure, you see the carvings on all the columns of the names. And this is where Dan Costley's name rests and where he's memorialized. I thought I'd start off with a personal story to show my connection with the First World War, which is the topic that we have today. And I'm sure a lot of you have uh, a similar story in your family or maybe um, friends that you know or close you know, in-laws or what have you that have a similar story uh, from the First World War. Of course, over the course of our, uh, our discussion, we should think about World War II and some other wars which help us understand how to commemorate and memorialize World War I. Um, but really our focus is on the First World War today. How many people have a relative that was uh, either killed or who survived the First World War? Few, yeah. Um, Canadians, were they in the Canadian Army? Yeah, a few? Yeah? Yeah, okay. What about British Army? Yeah. Any other forces? Bill? French. Okay. Well, um, what we're going to do is we're going to just walk through uh, the nature of remembrance, which is uh, part of the research that I've been involved with ever since I, I uh, conducted my doctorate at the University of Brighton. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, this whole notion of heritage dissonance and um, the conflict that we can have between heritage, what some people would say is tourism, and the whole thing of how we remember history. Uh, I also want to speak to the whole thing around personal meaning making when people visit battlefields and also uh, turn to, which, which is the crux of the discussion today, some of the controversies and challenges with remembering what is known as the Great War, the First World War. Um, and to do that, I want to provide some general examples, but I also want to focus on this idea of the Vimy effect, uh, which I'll explain a little later. And to do that, I'll talk about the, uh, the pilgrimage to uh, the Vimy site, which occurred in uh, 2007. And it's based on some research I did where I spoke to 15 to 18 year olds about their experience of going to, uh, to Vimy. So if we wanted to talk about uh, various research uh, theories, concepts, uh, I would point to this kind of um, interdisciplinary uh, study. So we have uh, material from anthropology, cultural geography, history, sociology, uh, tourism studies, um, and uh, there's a range of different uh, concepts that uh, take us into discussion on landscapes, um, meaning making, uh, semiotics, um, the politics of remembrance, a range of different topics which I'll touch on as we go along. So I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on definitions, but I think when we talk about remembrance, this one is a hard one. This one is a hard one to define because it means different things to different people. And I'll speak to two uh, definitions, two perspectives on remembrance. Um, but this, I just, these two photographs are interesting because um, one is at Tiepval Memorial, which is the memorial we just saw, which is in the Somme. And then the other one is at the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. And it's interesting because it does speak to the whole thing of that there's a certain act or set of actions that you should not do. Um, but what is it that you should do? And so um, 
that could be you know, physical action, but also what should we think and what are the consequences of how we think about war? So these are the kinds of things that I get into when I uh, tour battlefields, be it um, in Vietnam or in Normandy or in Flanders. So I'm going to give you two perspectives here. The first one is the, the broad kind of national perspective of remembrance. And this picture is taken at the, at the Normandy American Cemetery um, in 2009 when the um, uh, 65th anniversary of D-Day was commemorated. Barack Obama is there, of course, in the distance, as you can see. Um, and uh, so I was one of 5,000 people that went to this uh, intimate um, commemoration uh, that ha involved Stephen Harper and uh, Prime Minister Brown from the UK and Sarkozy from France. And uh, basically, it represents the whole um, nation state speaking about its population who sacrificed in war. And typically, when we talk about remembrance at this scale, we're talking about um, messages of, uh, of the nation and how the nation you know, thanks its warriors for the sacrifices that they made. This, of course, involves a lot of rituals and traditions that have, that have developed over time, some pre-World War I, but many as of the first commemorative period after World War I. So for example, the poppy, uh, cenotaphs, those kinds of things, you know, two minute silence at the cenotaph, those kinds of things. Um, were part of the whole national um, perspective on remembrance. What I engaged in at the beginning was what I have here as a second perspective on remembrance, and that is the whole idea of personal remembrance, where we think about uh, what it means to us. So a lot of people, when they stand out in the Cenotaph uh, uh, in Victoria or here at Royal Roads or anywhere in the world, they'll sit in silence and they'll reflect on the meaning of war from their perspective, their family, um, maybe they have to imagine it because they don't have any family that were in the war. And so really they, they have no connection, but they're thinking about, well, what it would mean to my son or daughter if they fought. So uh, in that way, we have the whole thing of personal meaning making that is, uh, that is going on there. This picture is actually of uh, a fellow named Cullis Lancaster, who's um, actually uh, one of the 90 Day Wonders who came out of Royal Roads University. Or Royal Military College, and he landed at um, first Juneau Beach. Uh, he was a he was a navigator on a uh, landing craft, and then at Omaha Beach. And here he is with his daughter, and this is the classic passing on the stories to family members. And this is the whole thing we can talk around kinship and remembrance, and uh, and so this is an area of study that I I'm particularly interested in with the veterans passing their stories on to their family members. Jay Winter, who's uh, done a lot of work on war and memory, he speaks to the whole area of, um, of remembrance from a generational perspective, which is quite interesting. And he views veterans as remembering in a different way than those people that are post-veteran generation. So um, whereas uh, a veteran will go to the cenotaph and basically as a witness, he doesn't or she doesn't need any uh, additional information coming in uh, because they can just recall their own memories. Post-veteran generation people, of course, they need to have information given into them so that they can imagine in order to remember. Right? So we're, we're kind of second-hand remembering, in a sense. So this raises a whole bunch of questions um, about um, what is good remembrance. These are acts of remembrance where we might watch a film, we might watch a documentary, we may um, go to a museum to learn, we may participate in a commemoration. But when we actually think about um, what is good remembrance, it raises a whole bunch of interesting questions which leads us into our discussion here. And uh, for example, should you dress up? Is this a good form of remembrance? So in the United States, you see a lot of uh, Union and Confederate reenactors when they've gone through the uh, anniversary of the uh, American Civil War recently. And so this is quite popular in parts of the world. In the case of Normandy, where this picture is taken, I'm looking at my screen back here, by the way, if you're wondering what I'm pointing at. Uh, it, this picture is of um, some Dutch uh, people that I met in a town called Aramanche. And they were wearing uh, Lincoln and Welland Regiment uniforms. 
And when I saw the uh, Canadian regiment, uh, I said, you know, why are you wearing the uniforms? Because some people could interpret that as a sign of disrespect. And they said, well, this is the regiment that liberated our town in Holland, and so therefore we wear this uniform every year in honor of them. Well, what, and in that case, you know, I think, you know, it was, they could speak to experiences that their family members had had. And so to me, it seemed like a good form of remembrance, right? Of course, these points are always a little bit debatable. But in the context of Normandy, what they decided what is good remembrance, what is bad remembrance, is that this, wearing an Allied uniform at this time, is acceptable, as long as you follow certain parameters that it's actually the real uniform. But they've made it illegal to wear any kind of Nazi uniform because it's just too close and because they don't find it um, acceptable. So there are lines that are drawn in certain parts of the world as to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in terms of remembrance. But when we talk about um, good remembrance and bad remembrance, we can get into a lot of interesting situations where we can talk about coffee cups. So visit the Omaha beaches, and then you can buy a coffee cup to remember your experience. Um, um, and then we can also get into the whole area of uh, tourism itself. And, and the reason why I say tourism can be seen as a, a, a bad form of remembrance is that it is seen as a way that we profit from war, that we commercialize it, we commercialize these sites and we profit from it. This is a poster of uh, last year's um, uh, tourism pavilion in, uh, in Paris, which basically recognizes that as of 2014 through to 2018, there will be an explosion of visitors to France and to Belgium, Gallipoli, and other sites uh, related to the First World War. And so this is basically a pavilion that is open to commercial operators. And the, con the, the controversy, conflict between tourism and remembrance has been there for decades. This is a poem from uh, Philip Johnson, who's a, uh, uh, a veteran of the First World War. And he wrote this uh, particular poem called Highwood in 1918. And I won't read all of it, <clears throat> but it gives a sense of uh, what he worries about uh, in terms of the future memory making of this particular site, Highwood, which was a battle uh, that occurred in uh, July right through until October in the Somme. And uh, he starts off that in the fighting for this patch of wood were killed somewhere above 8,000 men, of whom the greater part were buried here. This mound on which you are standing, Madam, please, you are requested kindly not to touch or take away the company's property as souvenirs. You'll find we have on sale a large variety, all guaranteed. And he goes on to speak about the property, which is owned by the tour company. Um, and, and you get a sense that the, the, the tourists that are there really don't care. They're not really linked with the story, and they're not really very interested. A very dark. Uh, image of tourism to a battlefield. This is Highwood today. Has anyone heard of Highwood? You? Well, this was a uh, place of a, an amazing Indian cavalry charge. Um, and it was a place of intense fighting. Uh, and it's just basically a farmer's field that goes down into a ravine and then up the other side to this wood, which is private property. There's two memorial markers, one to the Cameron Highlanders, actually, um, the Scottish Regiment. And, um, and basically, when you, you can drive by it and not even notice it. So this really speaks to the whole thing of how landscapes often become silenced or simply forgotten uh, and the day-to-day. -day. So in this sense, Johnson's worry that people would exploit it, commercialize it, visit it, did not come to pass. At the same time, we have forgotten it. And we can see this in, uh, in areas all over the world. And I guess this speaks to the whole thing around remembrance. And when you talk about remembrance, you also have to think about what we forget and what we silence. And this is a war memorial to a, a London regiment that I came across the other week when I was, uh, when I was visiting London. And it's tucked away right by the, uh, a few... Uh, 
filing ca cabinets that they're, th they're throwing out and uh, some other debris. And uh, this is the classic story of a lot of memorials that sit in urban centers and are essentially, essentially forgotten about. I, th I thought this was quite profound and Ken, uh, Christy and I wrote an article um, that starts off with the, uh, the, this as part of its title, Is It Nothing to You? This is on the v Vancouver War Memorial. And I think it speaks to the, the other challenge we have with remembrance in the 21st century, and that is relevance. Like, why should we remember? Okay, yeah, I remembered. I did my two minutes already. What else do you want me to do? And what exactly is the extent of this remembrance? And that, I think, is part of the challenge when we go forward and talk about a war that occurred 100 years ago, um, is what relevance is it to us today? Another challenge when we think about uh, remembrance we're covering a range here, in addition to tourism. But there's always a concern that we're glorifying war. And this is a picture at Point de Hoc, which is again a D-Day site. Um, on June 6th, the, uh, in the distance, you can actually see some uh, US Air Force pilots, the real McCoy. And then you have father with his sons dressed up. Um, and so um, there can always be the concern that we'll get into a situation where we start to glorify um, when we remember. Here's another concern that uh, we can talk about when we get into war remembrance of any kind. And in this case, I'll talk about the 9-11 site, which we can discuss whether or not it's actually a battlefield. But it's in, in the case of remembrance, we see some alignment here. This was the AT&T uh, piece that they, uh, that they put out uh, on their Twitter feed. And it was an immediate reaction from the public that this was disrespectful and not appropriate. And you see this kind of thing where you see uh, different companies, sometimes legitimately, uh, because many of their employees went off to war. Um, you'll, see in the, you'll see a corporation step forward and try to go through the act of remembrance by having an ad. In this case, it was seen that they were aligning it with their own product. And in this case, you, know, you, you got a lot of uh, pushback. So what I'm doing is I'm just running through various challenges we see with generally with remembrance before I get into World War I. The politics of remembrance, this is kind of a nice broad umbrella. And that's, uh, we can see that as being uh, where we have different uh, narratives of the past. And they can get into, uh, into contest with each other. Uh, and in this case, this is the uh, bridge at Sarajevo, close to where the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated. And I was there in uh, June this past year and it, for a conference, which just so happened to roll over the, uh, the exact date when the Archduke was assassinated. So I went to the, the tourism office and I said, so when is the, the service? And they said, there is no service. I said, what do you mean, there's no service? And uh, the tours that I went on over the course of the, uh, the days that I was there, they would speak about the assassination and they'd recognize the, the uh, event as the point at which the, it started the wheels turning towards war. But for them, the immediacy of the war that occurred from 1992 to 1995, the siege of Sarajevo, overruled something that happened 100 years ago. And of course, the person that shot the Archduke was a Serb. And so there's no way you're going to see Bosniaks recognize a Serb because back then it was actually celebrated. The assassination was celebrated. And this bridge was named after Princip for a period of time. But time has gone on and wars have intervened. And this memory will not be the starting point for the commemoration going forward in, in 2014. You simply won't see it. When I spoke to a general who was active in the 92-95 campaign, and I said, what are you going to do next year for 2014? And he said, concert, music concert. That's it. <laughs> and, and, you know, so this is, the, this is politics of remembrance. It's something that happened 100 years ago, and today it has a different meaning. And I think that's one of the things we need to remember with, with remembrance is that it's dynamic, it changes over time, and it's always political. We can almost say that that is remembrance, in a sense. Do you want to wait or do you take a... Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, 
politics and branding, um, the cliches that often become used, like freedom. Do um, you have any comment on that? It's almost like using freedom as a brand for just about any war. Some of them are not related to freedom. Yes, and I think that's, that's what we're going to get into. And I'm going to show you one example of that whole thing where we take an event, we mythologize it, and we bring it back, and we, we use it to mean other things, right? So this is a classic example of politics remembrance. And in this case, veterans rose up against the uh, Smithsonian, based in Washington, D.C., and said, hang on a minute, you're not going to revise history in terms of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. This is an exhibit in 1995 where they basically came forward and said, the museum said, you know, here's the Enola Gay, here's what the, uh, the atomic bomb looked like, here's how we uh, constructed it. Do we really have to drop it? Because there's a lot of academics that say that there was no, there's no real need that we didn't have to do it. That caused such a firestorm that the executive director of the Smithsonian lost his job, much of the board was fired, and the exhibit was closed down. So, um, so these can lead to quite an incredible um, fight. Of course, when we're talking about World War I, we don't have any veterans left to, to raise questions of legitimacy and, and credibility and factual accounts. But nevertheless, those, those discussions will, uh, will rise from time to time. I should point to the First World War Centenary site, which is run by the Imperial War Museum. Royal Roads is a member. It's free. It's great. Um, and what happens at this forum is that museums and archives from around the world are posting what they're going to do around World War I. So you'll hear from Texas. You'll hear from France. You'll hear from Scotland. You'll hear from all over the place what's going on. And that is where I actually go to get a lot of my information. And one uh, piece that you may want to find, uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, it's a PDF that came out of uh, Australian Veterans Affairs called The Century of Service. And this was a research piece they did a few years ago because the Australians are far ahead of <laughs> a lot of countries, very much so Canada. Canada's way behind. Uh, in terms of understanding what people want for the remembrance, for the commemoration period, and what they're going to do. So I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but what we have is uh, uh, the whole question uh, that Australia asked of itself and in their surveys to citizens, why should we commemorate the war? And what they came up with was a range of different um, ideas. So the whole thing around learning is always key to these ideas, um, the idea of improving knowledge. Um, and there was this whole thing around generating uh, relevance in the contemporary period. So the whole thing of redefining Anzac Day, redefining um, and revitalizing a Remembrance Day. So they identify what the legacies will be for the war. Uh, interestingly, things like tokens. Um, that's kind of an interesting idea, the idea of giving someone a piece of like a medal or something that allows them to be part of the legacy of, uh, of remembrance. Um, and this is the one that's really quite interesting, is the challenges they saw with commemoration. Um, are we going to water it down too much if we have too many commemorations? Um, are we um, going to uh, stop using the old traditions and therefore you know, um, not carry those forward? Uh, are we going to glorify war? And um, is there a threat that will become a little bit too jingoistic about it? Aussie rules, you know, we're great, we did it, you know, we didn't do it at Gallipoli, but hey, we had a, you know, it was a significant part of our history, and of course for the New Zealanders too. So, so all these worries about, you know, how should we do it? How's the best way to remember? So uh, they came to a set of goals which speak to relevance, um, making it relevant in the contemporary period, not just focus on the war, but actually focus on the whole hundred years of service, military service. Um, they want to focus on the educational element. They want to make it accessible to all. Because, of course, Australian uh, and its population, as for many countries, has changed. And so there's lots of uh, people that are uh, now Australians who uh, immigrated in, say, in the past two years or past 30 years that have no connection whatsoever from that 
uh, Anzac tradition. So the whole thing of accessibility is something that they're thinking through. I'm actually going down to Monash University at the beginning of December to work with Bruce Skates, who's actively involved with the National Committee, and um, presenting to, uh, we're doing a, a seminar there to talk about uh, issues to do with uh, war memory. And it's fascinating to see how they're approaching it and some of the discussions they're, ha they're having. So let's just turn to what Canada's doing. Uh, this was just released on October 21st. When I was in uh, Europe the other week, I made my way to Vimy where I presented to the superintendents and spoke to them about um, this idea of the Vim effect, which I'll get to in a little while. And my, um, I went through the Australian document. I just showed them the cover. I said, and, you know, this, this document, you know, we're all familiar with it. And they looked at me and they said, well, no, that looks fantastic. And uh, so I forwarded it to them. This is the superintendents of, of Vimy Ridge and of Beaumont Hamill, the two major Canadian sites. And, um, uh, basically, you know, we simply don't have that kind of policy making or planning going on on the, on the Canadian side, which is kind of uh, interesting in a way um, for a number of um, perspectives, which I'll speak to in a moment. But this is what the news release was of a, of a few uh, weeks ago. It was based on a, an agreement between Canada and France. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to participate in the Bastille Day Parade, which is, of course, in July every year, um, which is interesting in itself as our, our first act of remembrance, of official remembrance at the national level. We're going to um, have representation at the Battle of uh, Gallipoli commemoration in, 19, in 2015. Even though, um, so that's particularly for the Newfoundlanders that were uh, fighting there. Um, the quote that I put in here, the highlight of 2016 will be the 100th anniversary of the Battles of the Somme and Beaumont Hamel. Um, centennial events will culminate with the 100th anniversary at the ba of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, and then the battles related to Canada's 100 days in 2018. So some may say that's not enough. Others may say, what, what are the 100, you know, 100 days? <laughs> Like, so there's, uh, there's going to be a range of reaction to this kind of thing. And, and also you can see from the language, like a highlight. Well, or is it a low light? You know, uh, July 1st, 1916, there was you know, 50,000 men that were killed, uh, no, killed and wounded. And uh, so, it, you know, it was a traumatic part of history. Here are the three goals that are identified by the Canadian government that they want to focus on. They want to help pre preserve, maintain, and enrich heritage, representing the shared memory of the 20th century conflict. So that's, this is speaking about the partnership between France and Canada. Uh, continue to develop innovative ways to engage citizens, which, and I, they're, I mean, they're so ambiguous that I really don't know how to interpret them in a way. Strive to create opportunities for Canadian and French youth to experience their shared military history. So, Immediately, you know, we can talk about a range of things about uh, what Tony Seaton calls the heritage force field. Like, who's, who gets to drive the bus on what we're remembering and how we're going to remember it and what's the best way to remember? So, of course, the government, the state, can play a role. They can play a role like Australia, or they can play um, an indifferent role, right? Um, we have various organizations um, and associations. We have the media um, who will do their interpretation of the war and its meaning. We can also talk about communities here. Um, you know, we're talking about the battlefields over there, but what are we doing here in Victoria? What are we doing in um, Prince George or in uh, Dawson Creek or in all these different towns where uh, people left and headed over? Uh, what stories do we need to... Uh, tell and remember there. So there's a range of people that are involved in defining the story and telling the story. And this is, of course, the, where we really get into the politics because uh, we can get to a range of challenges. This is where I turn gears towards looking a little bit at tourism. Um, in this case, we have uh, a marketing agency involved with uh, defining world history. 
So a quick lesson on, uh, this is the D-Day beaches in uh, Normandy. And um, in April of last year, one of the tourism marketing agencies uh, that makes up about five regions in the, um, the western area here of, uh, of uh, Normandy, they said, well, we're going to market this whole thing as the mythic sector, the mythic beaches. Well, the problem is there's no uh, British beach there, sword, and there's no British um, Pegasus Bridge and all the British and Canadian airborne landings that occurred here aren't involved with this mythic beaches marketing. So the idea is to focus on the American beaches, which are quite popular. So there was a huge firestorm about this, and even it cuts off part of Juneau Beach. So in this case, what we have is we have uh, a marketing agency that was defining what was important to see and what wasn't. Right? So we, we do have this whole thing where people start telling us what we should focus on, what we shouldn't really focus on. And part of them are guides like these. This is, uh, this is me when I was 23 or something. Um, I was a tour guide at Vimy Ridge. And um, so I was involved right at that scale, right? So we've talked about government scale, and then we're talking about being uh, at that front line, as it were, of, of interacting with people when they step onto the Vimy Park and they're standing in a trench. They're like, well, what happened here? Who was here? And that was our role to tell them, right? It was our role to educate. And um, it was a powerful role, and it was a powerful experience personally for me. We take people into the, uh, not only the trenches, but into the tunnels down underground. And there was, there was an incredible tunnel system, and there's just one tunnel that remains open to the public. And we would take people down there, and um, it, was, it was quite profound. And of course, there's the massive memorial, which this uh, presentation started with, and we'll speak to in a little while. One day, um, in an extraordinary situation, one end of the park, we had a bus full of British veterans. It was the summer of 1990, so they were going to Dunkirk. They were following their route to Dunkirk, engaged in a pilgrimage 50 years ago, you know, 1940, June. The other end of the park, we had a German bus on their way to Paris. And, you, you know, just two different moods. One bus was remembering guys that got caught as POWs or executed or, or killed. The other bus was thinking about, you know, the good times, really, in one way. And I shouldn't generalize, but that's the way I sensed it. The, I was given the task of working with the Germans. So I met up with the Germans. They got off the bus, and they're like, hey, how are you doing? You know, and they said, tell us about your memorial. <laughs> so I started, and all I could give them was the Canadian story. I mean, I was up to names and addresses of Canadian soldiers at one point, but on the German side, I couldn't mention uh, anything significant. And that was as a, as a federal government guide. And that was just how we played it. This is where Canada became a nation. It was part of our line at Vimy. So there's some powerful uh, challenges when we start to think about who's in charge of the story and how it's told. But in the end, uh, this is just to get us in the whole tourism mindset, um, is we talk about co-constructed meaning that we mediate an experience through a guide or a museum uh, or a travel book or that kind of thing. And uh, it's the visitor that actually ultimately decides what to think. Are they going to go, you know what, this is all uh, the very reason why we need to focus on peace? Or is they going to say, this is why we need to have a strong military? Right? It's actually up to the visitor, no matter what to uh, make that decision. Um, we can also uh, think about war um, remembrance from this perspective, too, um, where there's different levels of war remembrance. And I think this is uh, important um, in that not all war remembrance is the same weight. So you can go down on November 11th, and you can bike down and, and catch the two-minute silence and stay for a couple wreath layings and then go home quickly you know so you've done it you've done the ritual and that may be good awareness and actually give you that sense of uh, that you've acted as a good citizen but when you actually do other things in particular when you go to a battlefield what I call the tourist performance of war remembrance it can be quite transformative for people standing in the footsteps of, of uh, soldiers uh, where 
fighting occurred can be a very profound experience and life-changing for some people. And we can often say that, that it's due to this whole thing of the aura of death of sights. Something that we have, a, obviously we have challenges in trying to cope and think that one through. And so when I do my research, I often find myself uh, talking to tourists. This particular quote is from a, um, an author, a historian, who visited the, uh, the D-Day beaches. And it, you know, in, if you're interested in this whole topic, tonight I'm doing a presentation in the castle at 7 p.m. and I get more into the visitor meaning-making side of, uh, of visiting battlefields and the way people make meaning and how they do it. But in this case, we're speaking to the aura of war. And this is what Bastable sounds. It says, even now the D-Day beaches have a stillness about them, a solemn air that makes you inclined to tread softly and keep your voice to a whisper. You go mindfully when you explore the landing grounds as if you were in a church. And it is not hard to tell where this sense comes from. It is the sanctity of spilt blood. You can still sense it, though the tides have washed over the beaches 40,000 times since the day of the battle. And in his narrative, we can see this whole thing of uh, it's almost like a religious experience. We talk about sacred ground. We talk about pilgrimage, which are a lot of terms that we might employ for um, more of a religious context. But surely, when we, so we can see this as a non-secular, sorry, sorry, I'll say it as a, a non-religious form of pilgrimage. And in this case, what you see is you see uh, people doing things in their performance of remembrance. So this is at Omaha Beach. Um, and in this case, this fellow, American, gets down low and takes a picture of the sand, right? Uh, someone else picks up a stone. And there's a certain infusion of sacredness in these objects and in taking these photos. So this is where we get into meaning making. And this is what I really wanted to get to in terms of when we talk about uh, the centenary, I've talked to some of the issues and challenges that we're going to have. But I also want to focus on what are the kinds of things that will go on when we get into the landscape, when people visit these sites. And when I actually do research in this area, it's challenging because, uh, you know, essentially you're speaking to tourists about their experience. So when do you ask them? You know, the, from a methodological perspective, is it, should I ask them when they're in the cemetery? Like, how do you feel now? What do you feel now? <laughs> you know, there's a whole thing of, but they're in the moment, right? So you really want to find out what's going on at that moment. So how do you do it? So there's a range of different approaches and there's a range of different articles that uh, have employed different approaches. But one thing is for sure, is that the whole thing of speaking to visitors about their experience has not been done that much. We're all tourists when we go to these sites. And I think sometimes tourism and tourists can be a bad word. And that I was like, they're not respectful, those tourists. I mean, they're sitting there and they're just taking photos or they're, you know, they're, they've just put a beer bottle beside the gravestone. I mean, what's that? That's littering. Well, is it? Or is it some kind of uh, uh, ritual that they've always wanted to do, is to provide a bottle of beer you know, at a grave marker? Uh, those kinds of things sound crazy, but people do those kinds of things as acts of remembrance. So to understand how people think and what they're reacting to, it's important to uh, actually engage in remembrance as the researcher. So you're actually not wearing a white lab coat and just watching people and observing. You actually have to engage in it, I think. Um, you, uh, and that is by taking tours and by observing people's reactions, hearing their comments. Um, and also um, post-trip uh, post surveys. So you're capturing what people are saying after uh, they've gone to these places. So I'm going to show you some of the comments that I had from um, youth, 15 to 18 years old, about their experience at Vimy. Actually, Brian and I were there in 2007. Um, so um, uh, we'll speak to that in a moment. But I just want to give you a sense of uh, the collision between history, myth, and people's experiences. And the history of Vimy Ridge is, uh, is probably something that a lot of us are familiar with in terms of that it was a Canadian battle in April of 1917. It actually lasted three days. Um, it actually occurred on Easter Monday, 
which is really interesting because as a result, there was, again, we talked about sacred ground, milk pilgrimage, we start using these, these terms that are tied to religion. There's almost kind of a, um, a religious element that became part of the narrative of Vimy after the war, that it was on Easter Monday and that Canada was born on this day. So uh, certainly some interesting kind of mythical attachments with uh, the history of Vimy Ridge. Um, it, is, it is the first time that all divisions came together to fight, uh, and the ridge was taken over three days. There was 10,000 Canadians killed or wounded across those three days, roughly. And um, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a victory, no doubt about it, but it was a diversion to the main offensive of that particular time. So um, it nevertheless got the image of being the, the moment when Canada was born because it was the first time that all the divisions had come together to fight. And so uh, it really marked Canada's coming of age and uh, has in a range of uh, ways um, been mythologized. So here's how the mythology works. And this was um, a student when I asked, like, why is it important to remember Vimy? She, pac she patiently explained to me that, and I'll just note the... Uh, about four elements here. It is important today because Canada was born on April 9th. It was symbolic because it was the first time the whole Canadian Corps fought together. This meant that Canada as a nation could work together to achieve victory in the face of great adversity and previous failure by the British and French. So it's a really interesting quick narrative of why do you remember Vimy Ridge to, to youth? And uh, I'm not saying that this isn't True, but it's interesting how we frame it and what we actually speak of it and what it means to us. So what happened in 1936 was this amazing um, national memorial was created and um, it was uh, built over um, about 14 years. Sir Walter Allward uh, was the architect and uh, was a remarkable um, uh, uh, memorial in that it, was, it just dominates the ridge you can see it for miles. Um, a few years ago, um, General Hillier, uh, who's the former chief of defense staff, he actually coined the term Vimy effect. And what he said, he was speaking to a group of business leaders, and he said um, that um, we need to remember Vimy Ridge because it was, um, you know, the whole thing of how we took the ridge was we, we, um, we empowered junior leaders and um, they, we employed innovation, and we competed, and we succeeded. And these are lessons that we can think about in the context of business today. And he called it the Vimy effect. It's in his book. And so this is an example of where you take a, a history, and you take a memory, and you redeploy it in a different way. Of course, we have uh, our $20 bill, which also uh, remembers the Battle of Vimy Ridge. The new one, of course, has the uh, emblem on the back, and here we have our heads of state with their, their $20 bill. And this was the um, government's um, press release. It is fitting that we are launching uh, these new notes at the Canadian War Museum only a few days before Remembrance Day. These new notes pay tribute to the sacrifices of Canadian men and women who fought to protect Canada and its allies in all military conflicts, said Minister Flaherty. They also protect Canadians from the threat of counterfeiting. The Polymer series is a Canadian innovation of which we can all be proud. So it's amazing when we take a, a, a historical event and we use it as a jump off point for a whole bunch of different things in different ways. Now, Richler actually looks at this from a very different and quite a, quite a concerned perspective when he says, you know, when Canadians tell the story of the Battle of Vimy Ridge as a creation myth, they tell it in a matter that prompts complicity rather than outrage. What, what is he speaking to here? Is he speaking to this whole thing? It's like, wait a minute, three days, 10,000 killed or wounded. What, you know, why are we talking about nation building and creation of a nation when we have that kind of blood on the field? 
And this is what he calls the Vimy effect. He calls it this whole thing where we take an event, we remythologize, and we spin it in different ways. So this is, I think, where you're going to see controversy with a lot of these things. When we talk about heroes, when we talk about sacrifice, and you're going to have to say, well, wait a minute. What was achieved? Why were they doing it? Did we actually achieve anything? What do we learn from it? So those, that's the, this is the classic controversy that we're, we're going to see, I think, throughout those four years. Now, this is a gang of um, uh, wearing their militia shirts. Um, these are the 3,500 Canadian youth that went to Vimy in 2007. And um, this is what they're faced with. And I want to just speak a little bit to landscape. When people go to these places, so we can have this, we can talk about Noah Richler and what he says, and it's quite profound. But on the other side, when you actually go to the battlefield, you've got all these ideas in your head. Canada's born here. Um, is it a good place? Is it a bad place? What am I going to do to remember? Um, and then the landscape starts speaking to us, and we start connecting and engaging with the landscape. So there's a plaque uh, left by uh, some uh, school children, and part of their study is often to do some research on a Canadian who died in the war. They're faced with another wall of names, just like at Tietal, which I showed you earlier, with 70,000 names. This has 11,285 names of Canadians who died and who were never identified. They have um, quite prof uh, powerful imagery. And this one is uh, the, um, the uh, passing of the torch. So it e evokes uh, John McRae's um, In Flanders Fields poem. And you see some other interesting things. And I'll note that there is very few actual military symbols. You don't see regimental names. You don't see rifles. You see the odd. Um, Cannon, you'll see the sword, right? So in this case, we call it uh, sympathy for the victims. Probably one of the only memorials that people see um, in the Western Front that actually recognizes the, the um, destruction and killing of uh, citizens. This is the breaking of the sword, which, of course, is the war to end all wars, which, you know, the irony of that it was opened and unveiled on, in 1936 is, is quite... Power, powerful. Um, and then, of course, there's Canada bereft, a uh, four meter high figure that uh, overlooks a, um, a cenotaph or crypt. And then we have the mourners, which is to represent a mother and father. And here we get into a few comments from students. So they've seen these things. They've seen there's a couple of small cemeteries there. Not all the people that died at Vimy Ridge are buried there, but they're, they're there and they're in the surrounding area. Uh, so just two cemeteries in the park. Um, so here's some things that people said before they went. I've always wanted to see this memorial up close. It strikes me as something that all Canadians should do before they die. As a Canadian is driving across the country or visiting every province and territory or learning French. So this is about being Canadian. Like, this is a national historic site. And um, it does hold that reverence. Another incredible um, carving. And these are the um, pillars, uh, the two pillars representing uh, France and Canada. And the, um, the figures represent truth, faith, justice, charity, knowledge, and peace. And they are together singing the hymn of peace. This is actually what's carved on the, the monument. So here's some messaging that is, we receive as, as visitors to this landscape. But then there's the things that are not actually written or spelled out for us. And that's just the landscape itself. These are old uh, trenches. You can see craters where uh, explosions had occurred. One of the most powerful memories about Vimy Ridge was being utterly shocked at how the earth had been destroyed by the battle. So these comments are of post-trip when I said what was most memorable about going to Vimy Ridge. The most powerful memory was firstly when the sun passed directly behind the monument, lighting up the entire background with an almost heavenly light. Here's a pre-trip comment. And I just want to kind of contrast what people thought when the, before they went to uh, what they uh, felt afterwards. And it also speaks to the whole kind of jingoism that we might see in the Canadian context. So here's the first comment. Remember, these are 15 to 18-year-olds. 
say, is it important to remember? Why? Yes, because it was the first time Canada proved itself as an independent to the Brits and the world. Woot, go Canada, woot. <laughs> so this whole, like a hockey game kind of mentality. Um, of course, without remembering the reason why Canada was so important in one of her most uplifting moments of victory, then really, what is it to look back and say that Canada has been successful in any way? So there's a whole thing around, you know, measuring our, ourselves by, by war. Um, each student represented a soldier that died at Vimy. There were a lot of students, meaning there were a lot of soldiers that died. So that was another powerful experience for people. When they could look around, they could actually see the numbers that they often read about. Just a couple more slides here. My most powerful memories of Vimy Ridge are when I was sitting on the ground and it really felt like something was trying to hold my hand. And also when I looked behind me and saw the sea of people in militia shirts, all representing different soldiers. It was like we were the soldiers and we were marching off into battle. Standing behind the grave of a fallen soldier was a very humbling experience. It was dreadful to think that this man died and they did not know um, who he is. It made me realize how lucky I am to live a life that is not endangered by war. Being able to touch the monument. Finally, this last one here. Every Canadian should visit. It brings an entirely different perspective to being Canadian. Last one. Sorry, it's not coming out very clearly. Um, it becomes so much more of a reality when you see these things firsthand. It gives you an image of what these men went through when they were so far away from home. And sometimes you can really feel the distance between the country you're in and home. These are all examples of where people are imagining, they're putting themselves in the shoes of soldiers, and they're reflecting on that, which is quite profound. So in terms of things like the Vimy effect and that whole thing of, you know, should we believe the myth? Should we not? Should we accept it? Should we argue about it? When people actually go into the landscape, I think when we're looking at just this uh, group, the 15 to 18 years old group, so they're going through the high school curriculum, they have this chance to go to France, they're there with their friends, they go into the landscape, they have this experience. I think what's happening is that it's going from being more of a nationalistic experience to a more personal experience where they're beginning to reflect on things like death and war. So you do see comments where people say, yes, I'm proud to be Canadian, you should come here if you're Canadian. But you're also seeing people that are meditating at such a young age on this whole thing of, of death and dying in war. So how do we co-construct meaning with that group? How should we go about telling them the story of World War I and what should they do and what would be good remembrance? Right? So these are the kinds of challenges, I think. And I present this not to say, here's the answer. This is what's happening with these people. But I just pointed out that um, going to the landscape can be quite profound for people, that they actually dig in and find a very emotional attachment to the experience. Yet it's shrouded in controversy in terms of how you interpret the war, what stories you tell. In the early 1960s at Pearl Harbor, they used to end the guided narrative with, the moral of the story is, be prepared. Right? And everyone went, right. That's what you got to be. They stopped that in the late 60s. They said, here's the story. Any questions? And those that had gone to Pearl Harbor over the years said, how come you're not saying be prepared? Like, that's the moral. And they basically, the National Park Service in the States basically said, we let the visitors decide. We focus on accuracy of story. So who's going to focus on accuracy of story as we go into 2014 to 18? You know, what, what are the um, uh, directions we wish to take when we engage in remembrance? How does it play out in our own communities in terms of action or something that's good? So lots of questions to think about. And um, it brings me to the end of the presentation. And uh, take any questions.
Joe, I think of the students. Um, um, what's the relation? Did they go on to do any other um, the battlefields? Mm -hmm. and what's the relationship of the experience there when there wasn't a big monument behind you? Yeah, I think I think sometimes like it's a, it's the classical. You know, when, when you look at a piece of architecture and it's this classical thing, it's like, oh, so this is what we're supposed to think. This is about peace. This is about the you know catching the torch. You know, be yours to hold it high. I understand that. Whereas sometimes when you just have a, a piece of landscape and there's no, no one telling you what to think, it's quite profound. So beaches, I found people going to the beaches um, amazingly profound for people. Or going to a place where there's a wall and uh, there's a story to it that you know, Canadians were executed here or Americans were executed here, that people um, people almost try to come to terms with it um, in a different way than a beautiful, white, um, glorious memorial to victory. So, um, yeah. But it can also get lost. That's the problem, right? A lot of sites that have no markers, you don't, you don't know what went on there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just jump in for a moment? It is 1 o'clock, so if anyone has to duck out, it's probably well, um, well, thanks, uh, obviously, for such a wide landscape, and there's a hundred questions in my mind. But I, I, I kind of like to believe what you conclude with, that people go there and move from a nationalistic sense to a more personal sense, and that this open-ended, not being told what to think, offers that opportunity. Mm. But there's something inside me, you know, I guess it's kind of contemporary cynicism or something, that kind of thinks, yeah, but they're still being corralled there. Someone's still taking them there. Yeah. And they have a motive in, in doing that. You know, the, the narrative might not be, be prepared anymore, but certainly in relation to the Second World War, it's never forget. It's kind of shut up. These people lay down their life for you. You know, so that, and, you know, I think we have to remember Whilst the First World War is seen very much as a, you know, a, a, a tragedy, a waste, and there are many critiques of it, the Second World War is still presented in terms of being the good war. And people forget half the stories of the Second World War. If it was such a good war, why did the Indians refuse to be dragged into it by the British, and then the British have to shoot 10,000 members of the Congress Party in, in order to, to force them into the war? You know, there's, there's many, many conflicting narratives. and. Uh, one thing that always strikes me is that the war becomes bigger and bigger the further and further away it recedes into history. And that's because contem for contemporary society, it's the last absolute in a relative age. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's still held up as this you know, good versus bad, truth you know, versus yeah. you know, falsehood. And actually, we should be critical of all the narratives. I, I kind of like the idea that everybody makes up their own version of it. But I still think that the state draws a lot of cohering mm -hmm. narratives from it yeah. that we would do best to yeah. interrogate. It's the World War II remembrance is, I think, distinctly different than any other war. Um, so part of that uh, press release was to say that this summer is the 70, 70th anniversary of D-Day. Um, the uh, 75th anniversary of the start of the war in 1939 will also be commemorated in September. So those things are quite different than when we talk about World War I. And of course, World War I was such an upheaval politically, culturally, socially um, incredible in a lot of ways. And I think that's where, the, that's where the powder keg is because I think people don't necessarily realize that um, unless they're They've done the reading, and they're they're kind of up to date on World War One and its significance in history. Um, but uh, definitely, I, I don't necessarily think that they cast off the national identity thing. I think what you see is that people start to, and I don't think always people just go there with a the national identity thing. But there's certainly a national fervor that you do see with Australians, with uh, Canadians, with uh, different nationalities. Um, Maybe not so much with in Eastern Europe. You're not going to see a lot of uh, commemoration uh, in the, for the Russians, interestingly enough. Um, but uh, I'm sure they'll do something. But it's just not the same kind of 
maybe experience or history or cultural memory that we have in the West. But um, certainly it's a chaotic memory that's going on. I think there is social identity going on where people are trying to understand it from the perspective of just a human being. That there's other people that kind of go, well, this is like typically Canadian, like General Hillier. You know, this is like, you know, we're all lumberjacks and we're all fishermen and so, and Vimy Ridge. So it's all kind of, it's all embedded in our DNA as Canadians. You know, it's essentially the, the thing that we sometimes do when we think about Vimy or as Australians do and as New Zealanders do about Gallipoli is that we kind of say that what they did is, is who we are, is really what it comes down to. Um, and I think, they're, I think a lot of people question that when they go. Yeah. I was just saying, Jeff, that the sort of purpose of the state in this, you know, and you have different states here, you have France, Germany, Britain, Canada, Australia, Japan, is to sort of create some sort of collective memory, right, around their role in the war. But that collective memory, it seems to me, as you pointed out in your slides, is coming into conflict all the time with the individual kind of creation of the memories that people have when they go to see these sites. So there is this kind of total conflict and contradiction in what, on the one hand, what the state is doing and what these people who are trying to create these memories as a sort of national collective thing and what individuals are saying. So, Really it, 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 the, it, it will be interesting because the French, for example, are going to have to deal with the colonial conscription that occurred in the First World War, where they stopped killing people in the Ivory Coast and started recruiting them to fight in France. So, you know, there's those kinds of, there's those kinds of issues that, say, France has to work through, and, and how are they going to present that, um, while at the same time acknowledging the huge human sacrifice that a lot of families will say, look, you know, I, I'm expecting the state to say something. So, yeah. In the first, in Second World War, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. The French state. That's ongoing. Yeah, that's certainly. And that's a, that's one of the interesting things when you look at these battlefields, is or even villages that are just adjacent to the battlefields that you layer different cultural memories. So we can go there and talk about the Canadian story, but when the German bus shows up and they said, yeah, my, my grandfather was here um, and uh, my father was part of the youth, the Hitler youth, right? <laughs> There's that whole story that's going on. And um, so you layer that story over that landscape and then there's the French narrative and there's a Moroccan narrative at Vimy as well. There's Moroccan cavalry that were there. There's a beautiful memorial to the Moroccan cavalry. Um, so, you know, you, you have a number of different layers of, of memory and meaning associated with these, these places. And, and they're in conflict, and then they, they, they interplay with each other. But don't you think all these buses arriving for a shared collective experience speaks to the vacuum that exists in contemporary collective experience? You know, it's almost the only collective experience you can find that's worthy of celebrating is in the past. That speaks to a tragedy in the present. Mm. And to me, that's you know, one of the debates that we should be having about remembering the past, is to say, well, you know, it, it, it's almost as if we can only find our identity there because we're so kind of either disaggregated or ashamed of it, or it seems to lack any coherence in the present. And it strikes me that many governments who lack a vision for the future mm. you know, just trade on the past in, in order to yeah, I mean, there's some challenging thoughts there, and, and uh, uh, certainly, you know, the whole thing how memory forms uh, our sense of, you know, national identity, uh, even personal identity. Um, those are those are big questions to explore. Yeah, um, yeah. The uh, age, there were teenagers uh, who were on a pilgrimage. Um, Paul Fussell, who died last year, an American written wrote, says there will always be war as long as 19-year-old boys. Mm. What's the uh, research show as, as people, as we age and go through different passages and look at the, the narrative that comes up when we hear the stories? Does it change as we age? Yeah, I, I didn't do um, any adult um, research at Vimy. I did it at Normandy. And what I saw there was uh, I did, peop I did see people who would walk, say, to the Normandy American Cemetery, and they'd say, 
this is why we need a strong military and other people saying this is why America is messed up and we need to have a focus on you know uh, international cooperation so you get people that would use a site to help um, give more of a greater assertion to their original view um, and then for some people it was ch it changed them right so um, I think that uh, I mean, witnessing it as a guide when I would take Canadians up to the memorial, it, it was a very tearful experience for people. Um, sense of pride, sense of loss, all these kinds of things, even if they had no immediate relative to it. Um, so um, I don't have a, a fast answer to you, but I do think that you know, the whole contested narrative that Bill pointed to and, and Ken, I think that's really part of remembrance that we're going to see going forward. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if your, uh, your comments would be the same if you were 19, when you were 30, something at the yeah. age for appreciation of knowledge changes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Yeah. Brian, last one? Um, yeah, I was there with Jeff in the, at the event. And uh, also had a, my great uncle Rupert, I got killed at the Somme when I went over the top. First, within the first couple of months, it was at Somme, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And um, with Jeff found him in the Waterway Street. Um, the observation I had is that there's an there's a internal uh, experience of the landscape itself, as you mentioned, going through the trenches and going out. That was the most profound thing for me. But the other thing that I found profound was the way that it was enacted. In other words, the performance, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, during the ceremony. It was, I thought it was very, very deeply touching. And yet, I think there's, there's a separation between the political <coughs> agenda of, say, the Harper government or in, in trying to use this as a means of rallying people uh, on the mem in the memory of, a, of events past. Uh, we can't really remember Afghanistan in the same way, right? Uh, it's a very different kind of situation. But what it was, was that you can, separ I found the capacity of separating a, a very deep uh, emotional connection to what happened in those trenches, because it was so visible in the landscape, from the political, the ideological agenda which was obviously overlaying the whole thing. Yeah. But the, you can make that distinction yourself. And I think teenagers are white people are making that as well, because we can yeah. see it going on around us. Yeah. I, 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 th I think they, they do, and I think they evolve in their opinions. I tried to do a follow-up survey six years after, a little too late after. <laughs> and I only got a few responses. <laughs> but that kind of thing where you're tracking people over time, I think is uh, certainly um, valuable. Um, but I, I think that people are very wary of government trying to manipulate the story and putting it forward. And you will see people that will keep, them, keep an eye on them, keep an eye on companies, keep an eye on organizations and the kinds of messaging they're using. I think, and I think that's where the controversy will arise when people step out of line, as it were. Right? So you'll, you'll see that kind of debate going on, I think, over the four years. Yeah. But non-government manipulates it as well. Right? Yeah. Their narrative is we're all victims and look, humans are barbaric. Well, actually, no. Some humans are barbaric. Most of us were cannon fodder in that world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, definitely. It, there's, it, what's good, I think, is that we'll, it will institute discussion, you know, which is good, in a way, uh, to think about these things and bring them in a contemporary setting. <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.